Well, we have a full session for you today, so we're going to begin. And great to see we've got folks calling in from all or tuning in from all over the Commonwealth. Um, welcome to Preservation, uh, Preservation Academy. I'm Elizabeth Castelny, and I am the CEO of Preservation Virginia, and we're delighted to have you with us. Uh, putting together the Preservation Academy requires a lot of coordination and planning, so our thanks go to Sonia Ingram, Preservation Virginia's Associate Director of Preservation Field Services. Uh, this is our final session for uh, this year, and there's been a lot of work, and we appreciate all that she has invested into uh, the program. I also want to acknowledge our panelists who will be introduced in just a few minutes and to the uh, Virginia Department of Historic Resources for their support and collaboration throughout this 2023 series. Uh, we work with the department on almost a daily basis and um, we're grateful for that work. We wouldn't be uh, able to put on our programs at Preservation Virginia without Sponsors like Peachtree House Foundation, Daniel and Company, Monument Companies, Historic Richmond, and Commonwealth Advisors. And I also want to thank all of you. Your registration fees help underwrite the programming and other educational opportunities that we bring um, to communities across the Commonwealth. Today's session focuses on the Historic Rehabilitation Tax Credit Program. Since 1997, this program has stimulated more than $5 billion in private investment, incentivized by the credits that are issued by the Commonwealth. While some view this credit program in terms of the large scale uh, development projects like converting a, his, a former historic bank building into a hotel, more often than not, the program is used by small business owners and homeowners to rehab smaller buildings for their individual purposes. Um, and so we think it's a vibrant program and it keeps uh, Virginia's historic fabric intact. And it's a, a, a program that has been so successfully mounted in communities across the Commonwealth that we wanted to bring a host of experts to help you understand how you might use this program on your own projects. Before we dive into that, we have a bit of housekeeping. And I'm sure by now you're used to most of these items, but we'll go over them anyway. Um, you may, you, we will hold questions till the end of the webinar, but you can ask your questions at any time. You can post those in the Q&A box. We'll keep track of those programs and respond to as many as possible. Um, you might have just noticed that you can turn on closed captioning by going to the bottom of the Zoom screen and locating the three dots um, and more will pop up. You can click on captions and show captions. And I believe Sonia is going to put those instructions in the chat box. We are recording the session and you'll receive a link in the next couple of days. Um, or you can also check both Preservation Virginia's and DHR's websites. So we want to get on with this. We have a lot to share this afternoon, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Amanda Terrell, at the Virginia Department of Historic Resources for some introdu introductory remarks. Thank you, Elizabeth. Hello, everyone. I'm Amanda Terrell, Director of the Community Services Division at DHR. I'm standing in today for our director, Julie Langan, here for the last installment of the Preservation Academy this season. I'm so glad that we're doing this session for homeowners, for folks who may not think about historic preservation every day like some of us do, yet can still participate and realize the benefits of historic preservation. And I'm so appreciative of folks who own historic houses and want to take good care of them. And this program helps you do that. So I hope that folks learn a lot today. And thanks as always to Preservation Virginia for their great partnership with DHR in this and so many other programs. And so now I will turn it over to Morale. Thank you. 
Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm Morale Calbian, and I'm owner of um, Morale S. Calbian Preservation Consulting Services in Berryville, Virginia, and I will be your moderator. Before we start, I just want to briefly introduce our esteemed group of panelists in order of appearance. We have Jessica Ugarte, who's the Tax Credit Program Supervisor at the Virginia Department of Historic Resources. Chris Novelli, the Tax Credit Specialist at the Virginia Department of Historic Resources. Summer Laufen, a Tax Credit Reviewer at the Virginia Department of Historic Resources. Carolyn Zemanian, a Tax Credit Reviewer at the Virginia Department of Historic Resources. Allison Blanton, an architectural historian and vice president of Hill Studio. Paige Pollard, who's principal and architectural historian and preservation planner at Commonwealth Preservation Group. And then you'll see me again at the end um, and be wrapping it up that way. So I think um, Jessica is gonna give a little introduction and yeah. Chris. Yes. So hello, as um, as I was just said, my name is Jessica Ugarte, and I'm the supervisor of the Virginia Historic Rehabilitation Tax Credit Program. Today, we'll be talking specifically about the state tax credit, which is unique in that it's available to homeowners. There is also a federal tax credit for income producing properties, but that is not what we will be talking about today. In brief, the Virginia Tax Credit pro Program provides a dollar for dollar reduction in an individual's state tax liability. The potential credit is 25% of the eligible rehabilitation expenses of the project. And we're gonna talk a lot more about that. I'm now going to pass you off to um, some very wonderful presentations done my, by my colleagues, Chris Novelli, Summer Louthen, Carolyn Zemanian, to tell you more about how a homeowner will actually be able to use this program. All of us will be available for the question and answer session at the end of today's presentations. My name is Chris Novelli, and I'm the tax credit specialist for the tax credit program at the Virginia Department of Historic Resources. Today, I'll be giving a brief introduction to the tax credit program and the application process. The Virginia Rehabilitation Tax Credit Program was founded in 1997 to help property owners revitalize and rehabilitate historic buildings. The amount of the credit is 25% of eligible expenses or anything that would be considered a capital expense. The Virginia Rehabilitation Tax Credit can be used by homeowners as well as owners of commercial or rental properties and other types of properties too. So the way it works is that the credit is issued for the year the project is completed. The owner would subtract the amount of the credit from what they owe on their state income tax for that year. If they don't owe enough in taxes that year to use up all of the credit, they can carry it forward for an additional 10 years, making it 11 years altogether. Three things need to happen in order to have a successful tax credit project. First, the building needs to have a historic status. Second, there is a cost threshold that needs to be met. And third, the work needs to meet the Secretary of the Interior standards for rehabilitation. Today, I will be discussing the first two of these items. I'll conclude with a brief introduction about the tax credit application process. In order to be eligible for Virginia Rehabilitation Tax Credits, the building needs to be historic in the first place. There are three ways the building can qualify as historic. It can be a contributing resource in a historic district that is listed on the National Register of Historic Places, or it can be individually listed on the National Register. Additionally, it could be determined eligible for individual listing, but doesn't have to actually be listed. In this case, we, DHR, would need to evaluate the property. Regarding historic districts, there are local or city historic districts, and then there are national register historic districts, districts that are listed on the National Register of Historic Places. This is the type of district that a building needs to be in to qualify for Virginia Rehabilitation Tax Credits. In many cases, local historic districts and national register historic districts might overlap each other but still have slightly different boundaries. Therefore, it is important to know which type of district the building is in. 
However, just being within a district doesn't automatically qualify a building as historic. It needs to be considered contributing to the district. It needs to have been built during the period that is considered historic for that district. This is called the period of significance. Every National Register Historic District has a period of significance, which is the period during which the district acquired the characteristics that made it eligible for listing on the National Register. Usually, a period of significance for a district will end 50 years before the district was listed on the register. Therefore, every district will have a different period of significance. Buildings built within that period are generally considered contributing to the significance of the district. Buildings that were built after that period are considered non-contributing to the district and would not be eligible for rehabilitation tax credits. Even if a building is located within a historic district and was built during the period of significance, it may still not be considered contributing if it has been completely altered and no longer retains its historic appearance. In this case, we say a building has lost its integrity. Typically, it is just exterior alterations that will determine whether a building is no longer contributing. This is a house in Richmond that has been determined non-contributing to its district. With the aerial view, it's easy to see why. As part of the rehabilitation tax credit application process, the reviewer will examine the building to determine whether it still retains sufficient integrity of design to be considered contributing. This is the purpose of the part one application, which I'll talk more about later. A building might have been considered contributing when its district was listed many years ago, but a lot can happen to a building over the years and it might be unrecognizable now. There are a couple of ways to find out whether a building is contributing to a historic district. Every National Register Historic District has a nomination that can be found on the DHR website, and every nomination, except for the very early ones, will have an inventory of all of the properties in the district listed by address. Usually, if a building is non-contributing, it will say non-contributing on the nomination inventory. The period of significance for the district can also be found on the nomination. Most of the time, they are located on the third page, but not always. Earlier nominations will often only have centuries listed, and often these will just have the 20th century marked. In cases like this, where specific years are not given, it's standard practice to take the year the nomination was listed on the National Register, usually found on the first page, and then subtract 50 years to determine the end date for the period of significance. Alternatively, to see if your building is contributing to a district or to check on the historic status in general, you can always give me a call and I'll be happy to look the building up. If the building is not located in a historic district and the owner is seeking tax credits, we will need to evaluate it to determine whether or not it is individually eligible for listing on the National Register, which would also make it eligible for the Virginia Rehabilitation Tax Credit Program. The Department of Historic Resources has an evaluation committee that meets every two weeks to evaluate individual properties and potential historic districts for listing on the National Register. The property owner would need to fill out a preliminary information form called a PIF for short. They would need to describe the property and make a case that the building is significant because of its architecture or because of its history or because it was associated with a significant person or because of its potential to yield archeological information. Keep in mind that the house doesn't have to be Mount Vernon and it could be significant because of local history or a local person who was significant in the community. That said, the bar for being determined eligible for individual listing is a lot higher than for just being a contributing resource in a historic district. The owner would need to make a case that the house is unique in some way that sets it apart from all the other houses around it in that locality. This is the Maggie Walker House in Richmond. Maggie Walker was a bank president and a leader in Richmond's African-American community during the early 20th century. To pursue evaluation for your house, you will need to contact the architectural historian in the regional office for your part of the state and request a preliminary information form. You would need to fill that out and return it to them along with photographs of the house inside and out and any historic outbuildings or structures on the property. They will then present it to the next evaluation committee meeting in Richmond. Once the committee has determined that the property is eligible, 
that is your green light to move forward with the tax credit application process. Keep in mind that the determination of eligibility does not become official until the state review board meets and they meet four times a year. And again, for the Virginia Rehabilitation Tax Credit, the property only has to be determined eligible for listing, but does not have to actually be listed on the National Register. In order to qualify for rehabilitation tax credits, a certain cost threshold must be met. If the building is what we call owner-occupied, that is, it is the owner's house and they live there, the owner must spend at least 25% of the assessed value of the house for local real estate tax purposes for the year before the project started. The start of the project is the date that the first eligible expense was incurred. And again, it is just the assessed value of the house, not the land. The expenses that are used to reach the cost threshold must be eligible expenses for the program. That would include any work done to the structure of the building and anything that would be considered a capital expense. It would include new mechanical systems, including heating, cooling, plumbing, and electric. It would also include updating kitchens and bathrooms. It would not include anything that might be considered personal property, such as furniture, anything that could be easily removed from the house, including window treatments or kitchen appliances. Eligible expenses can also include things like asbestos and lead abatement. Certain soft costs may also qualify. These would include things such as architect and engineering fees, project review fees, and the cost of hiring a tax credit consultant to do the application paperwork. Three forms that you will see are the tax credit applications, parts one, two, and three. These forms can either be downloaded from the DHR website or emailed in a tax credit packet upon request. The DHR website is dhr.virginia.gov. The purpose of the part one application is to verify that the building has a historic status either in a district or individually. Even if the building was contributing to a district when it was listed, it needs to be examined again to make sure that it is still contributing. For the part one application, we need photos of the house showing the condition prior to rehabilitation on both the interior and the exterior. We need four photos showing all four sides of the exterior and we need photos of the interior showing all levels of the building. Any outbuildings or structures on the property also need to be listed on the part one with their approximate date and photographed to determine whether or not they are contributing to the property, even if they are not historic and not part of the project. The part two application is where you describe all the work you plan to do and is the longest of the three applications. The reviewer will review the scope of work to ensure that it meets the Secretary of the Interior's standards for rehabilitation. The final application is the part three, which is submitted after the project is finished with photos of the completed work and a CPA financial review. Once the part three review is complete and the project is approved, we will send a letter of certification stating that the project is certified for credit. The owner would then attach a copy of the letter along with a schedule CR form with their state income tax return. This concludes my presentation. If you have any questions, I can be reached at 804 482-6097 or at chris.novelli at dhr.virginia.gov. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Summer Louthan. I'm an architectural historian and historic tax credit reviewer with the Virginia Department of Historic Resources. Today, I will build off of Chris's introduction to the program and will discuss with you the historic tax credit application process, more specifically completing the part two application, project amendments, amendments part three application, as well as project timing. We'll close out with keys to successful rehabilitation projects, as well as potential pitfalls to avoid. As Chris discussed before, the State Historic Tax Credit Program has a three-part application process. As a tax credit reviewer, I am generally seeing the project for the first time when the part two application is submitted. The part two application is the most complex of the three part application process. It requires certification that the work proposed in your project will meet the Secretary of the Interior standards for rehabilitation. All aspects of the project must comply with these standards. DHR reviews all work associated with the project involving both the interior and exterior of the building and including all attached adjacent or new construction within the boundaries of the property. 
In order to evaluate the proposed project, DHR requires a narrative description of the property's existing condition and a clear narrative description of all work proposed to be completed on the historic building and associated outbuildings at site. The more detail provided, the better. Projects that provide limited information on work proposed are likely to be placed on hold for more information. The work scope items should follow a logical progression, such as moving from the exterior to the interior and from the ground floor to the roof. It is recommended that you discuss all features, even features where no work is proposed. It is important to note that the written application takes precedence over all other documentation, such as drawings or photos. Therefore, it must be comprehensive and include all treatments proposed for the historic building and site. The application should never just say, see plans. Along with the application, you will need to submit supporting documentation, including photos and plans. Good quality, comprehensive photographs taken before work begins allow your reviewer to understand the historic structure and its existing condition, to understand and evaluate the scope of work for compliance with the standards, and later to compare the completed work to the proposed work scope and the pre-rehabilitation condition of the building. The photos should be well lit and clear, be printed at a minimum size of four by six, and they should be labeled with the building name and or address, photo number, view, and description. These images can be printed two to a page as in the example here or on individual printed photos with the descriptive label included on the back. It is recommended that you provide photos of the site and surrounding environment, all exterior elevations, typical exterior features such as the siding or windows if these features are not adequately captured in the overall exterior photos, details of any deteriorated exterior and interior features such as peeling paint, deteriorated windows, damaged plaster, or previously altered features and spaces. You should provide photos of any outbuildings such as garages, barns, and dependencies. You'll need to include photos of all interior spaces, typically taking two photos from across a room or hall is sufficient. We recommend paying special attention to areas where significant work or floor plan changes will be accomplished. You may want to include photos of distinctive interior features such as staircases or mantelpieces, and you should also include photos of areas where no work is proposed. Generally, 24 to 36 photos are sufficient for the average single family home. However, it is always better to have more photos than too few. Lastly, the photos will need to be keyed to a floor plan of the building, using arrows to show the direction of each view as seen in the example on the right. If you're submitting your part one and part two applications at the same time, then one set of photos may be submitted. In addition to the photos, you will need to submit architectural drawings or sketches showing the existing condition of the property and the proposed rehabilitation work, being sure not to combine before and after conditions into a single drawing unless no changes are proposed. For smaller, less complicated projects, hand-drawn sketches may suffice, but they must be sufficiently detailed to show existing wall configurations and any anticipated changes. If you're planning exterior alterations, new additions, or new construction, you will need to submit both floor plans and elevation drawings. As a reminder, work shown on the drawings that is not described in the narrative of the Part 2 application should not be assumed to be approved. There are several ways that your DHR reviewer might respond to your application. We could approve all work proposed. We could approve the proposed work with specific conditions to ensure the work meets the standards. We could place your project on hold and request missing information such as more photos or more detail on the work proposed. We could also place your project on hold because the proposed work does not meet the standards but should be able to meet the standards with specific plan changes. Or we could deny the project. More on what could cause the project to be denied later. You might wonder, what if my project changes? DHR understands that projects change or that new information may come to light during your rehabilitation. It is important that all new information be submitted to DHR for review and approval on the continuation amendment form. While emails and in-person meetings can be helpful, they're only for informal guidance. Any substantial changes to the approved scope of work must be submitted as an amendment for formal review and approval. If you have any questions on if something should be submitted as an amendment, you should reach out to your assigned reviewer. We're here to help you through the process. You should be aware that failure to su submit amendments addressing additional information requested by DHR or changes to the proposed scope of work could result in delay of the review and approval of your Part 3 application or even in project denial if the unapproved work does not meet the standards. The Part 3 application certifies that the project has been conducted according to the approved Part 2 application and that the work is consistent with the standards. The ownership of the property has been properly structured and is accurately represented, 
and all expenses, expenses have been properly incurred and are eligible for the rehabilitation tax credits. Please note a complete part two application must be received by DHR within a year of the project completion date. Part three applications submitted over a year after the project completion date are not eligible for the state historic tax credit program. A complete part three application must include a filled out and signed part three application, photos of the completed work, an audit or agreed upon procedures report completed by CPA, and the part three review fee and billing statement. If it is determined that any of the work was not completed as proposed and approved and does not meet the standards, remediation may be required before the project can be certified or the project may be denied. The photos submitted with your part three application should show all areas of the structure, both where work was completed and where no work was completed. The part three photos should, as much as possible, follow locations where the part two photos were taken. It's recommended that for specific technical repair work, such as masonry repointing or window restoration, detailed images be provided. And like the part two photos, the part three photos should be keyed to a floor plan. Lastly, a cost certification from a qualified CPA is required in order to document and certify eligible project expenses. Whether the required reporting is an agreed upon procedures report or AUP or an audit depends on the project cost. An AUP report will be conducted for projects with a total rehabilitation expense of less than $500,000. And an audit is required for projects with expenditures of $500,000 or more. You will want to make sure that you keep good financial records, including receipts and invoices, so that you can hand them over to your CPA. An AUP requires review of 100% of the project costs being claimed. One question we often get is how long do I have to complete my project? The rehabilitation does not have to be completed within any particular period of time. However, the material rehabilitation test must be met in a consecutive 24-month period that ends sometime during the year in which the credits are claimed. Essentially, this means for most projects, the greatest expenditures must be made within a two-year period, ending in the year in which the project is completed. For phase project, this time limit is extended to 60 months. Keys to a successful project include contacting DHR early in the planning process for advice on rehabilitation treatments, submitting a complete application before beginning work, responding fully to any questions asked or additional information requested by your reviewer, submitting good, clear photos of the entire building and site before work begins, ensuring that your part two narrative describes the full scope of work, remembering that the written application takes precedence. Have a clear understanding of the character defining elements of your building and the standards. This will be discussed further in the next presentation. Follow through with the work as approved and submit amendments for any changes after work begins. And be an informed owner. Know what work is happening at your home throughout the construction project. Potential pitfalls to avoid include proceeding with work before the part two is approved. Please note any work completed before you receive project approval is done at your own risk. If completed work does not meet the standards, it may require remediation to be approved, which will likely cost you more money and time. Refusing to negotiate project changes in response to DHR's conditions, which could result in a project that does not meet the standards and cannot be approved. Changing elements of an approved project scope without submitting an amendment and receiving approval from DHR. If this work does not meet the standards, it could require remediation. And assuming local review or approval equals approval from DHR. You should never assume that receiving a building permit or approval from your local design review board means that DHR will approve the work as proposed. And leading causes for denial include insufficient pre-rehabilitation photos when the work has already begun, work that does not meet the standards already completed, submitting a finalized project design that does not meet the standards and cannot be easily modified, completed inappropriate work to the structure and surrounding site, substantial interior demolition, and new construction that is not compatible with the property. In conclusion, reach out to our office early in the project planning process, and remember your reviewers are available to assist you through your project, so make sure to reach out whenever you have questions and always inform DHR of project changes. You can find more detail on the information presented here on our website, including several new guidance documents. Thank you. Hi, my name is Carolyn Zemanian, and I am one of the Historic Tax Credit Reviewers at the Virginia Department of Historic Resources. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we, as reviewers, evaluate the proposed work that comes to us as Historic Tax Credit Projects. All work associated with a Historic Tax Credit Rehabilitation Project must meet the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation. 
The standards for rehabilitation are a set of 10 broad philosophical principles that provide guidance on the preservation of historic architectural fabric and character. The standards are applicable to buildings of all types, sizes, uses, and materials. They address both interior and exterior work, as well as extend to the treatment of the building's site and environment, including the associated landscape and related new construction. There are three basic principles to keep in mind when thinking about how the standards for rehabilitation should be applied to historic tax credit projects. First, historic materials, features, and spaces must be retained and repaired wherever possible. Where historic features or materials are missing or damaged, they must be replaced in kind to match. A property's historic character must also be retained, even if the building's use changes, and new additions and changes to the historic property should be compatibly designed and reversible. Now let's briefly review each of these standards. Standard number one requires that a building be used for its historic purpose or be placed in a new use that requires minimal change to the defining characteristics of the building and its site and environment. The photos on the slide show the proposal to change a windowless warehouse into residential apartments, adding multiple windows and balconies to a primary elevation of the structure to accommodate the new residential use would not be approved. The monolithic unpierced exterior of this property is an integral part of the building's appearance and historic character. This proposal would not meet the standards. This adaptive reuse project is one that better meets the guidance of the standards. An open train shed has been converted to an ice rink. The shed has been closed with large sections of glass that still preserve its open character. And in the interior, the building's character-defining exposed structural system and wide open volume have been preserved. Standard number two is the catch-all standard. It prohibits the removal of historic materials and the alteration of character-defining features and spaces. In this good twin, bad twin example, you can see that the building on the left has had its historic clapboard siding covered with modern vinyl. The original two over two windows have been replaced with one over one units and the decorative historic woodwork has been removed. None of these changes meet standard number two as they significantly alter historic materials and the original appearance of the structure. Standard number three prohibits work that creates false history through the addition of conjectural architectural features. Here is another good twin, bad twin example. The right-hand structure retains its original Italianate design and materials. The left structure, on the other hand, has been updated with colonial revival style features, including modern vinyl or aluminum siding, a multi-light window configuration, and a different style of pediment over the door. None of these architectural features historically existed on this structure, and we would not approve these kinds of architectural changes if this work were proposed as part of a historic tax credit project. Standard number four acknowledges that most properties change over time and requires that changes that have acquired historic significance in their own right shall be retained and preserved. The house in this picture was built in the late 1700s. 100 years later, it received an architectural overhaul. A decorative front porch and exterior cornice were added and ornate woodwork was applied to interior walls. Although these 19th century architectural features are not original to the dwelling, they are important to understanding the property's physical evolution over time. The later additions have become a part of the building's history and significant in their own right. Standard number five, like standard number two, is a catch-all standard requiring the character-defining features and finishes are preserved during the rehabilitation. This would include things like the historic roof material, siding, interior woodwork, and interior floor, wall, and ceiling finishes that should be preserved during a historic tax credit rehabilitation. Standard number six requires that deteriorated historic features be repaired rather than replaced. Where deteriorated features must be replaced, the replacements must closely match the historic features design, color, texture, and materials. The replacement of missing features must be supported by documentary, physical, or pictorial evidence. Here you can see a craftsperson replacing the historic siding on the structure only in the locations where it is deteriorated beyond repair. And here you can see how a missing historic porch was restored using pictorial evidence. The details of the replacement porch were designed to restore the building's documented original appearance. Standard number seven seeks to ensure that new physical and chemical treatments not cause damage to the historic materials to ensure the continued longevity of the property. Some examples of inappropriate damaging work would be saw cutting stone, sandblasting brick, or inappropriate mortar repointing. Although we do not frequently deal with archaeology in historic tax credit projects, it is always important to consider below ground resources. Standard number eight requires the protection of significant archaeological resources or mitigation if the site must be disturbed. Standard number nine provides guidance on appropriate new work. This is an interesting standard because while it makes good sense once you think about it, it is not always intuitive. Standard number nine requires that new additions, exterior alterations, or related new construction not destroy character-defining historic materials, and that new work be differentiated from the old and compatible with the massing, size, scale, and architectural features to protect the historic integrity of the property and its environment. 
New features or new additions in historic structures should not imitate the historic features, but instead should be contemporary and compatible in design to allow a careful observer to understand which aspects of a historic building are historic and which are modern. For example, if a new wall is being added in the interior of a historic building, the woodwork on that wall should be slightly differentiated from the historic woodwork to mark this partition as modern. And if a new addition is being constructed, it should be appropriately sited on a secondary or rear elevation, be subordinate to the historic structure, and built of sympathetic materials and design. We don't want the new addition to be mistaken as a historic portion of the building, but nor should it be so different that it competes with or overshadows the historic structure. These images show an appropriately located, contemporary, and compatible new addition. While sympathetic in design, this small addition possesses a different brick bond, different windows, and a simplified cornice that render it distinct from the historic structure. Standard number 10 requires that new work to historic structure is done in a reversible manner that preserves the essential form and integrity of the historic property. Basically, if an addition is demolished in the future, the historic building envelope should be largely intact. The building shown in this image does not meet this guidance as the new addition envelops the historic structure. But the addition we looked at previously does meet this guidance. The essential form and massing of the historic building remains intact and is not integral to the modern addition. And now I'll give a brief overview of some common rehabilitation concerns. We do not typically approve changes to the primary facades of the structure, as these are the most public and significant faces of the building. Windows should be retained and restored wherever possible. It is not uncommon for applicants to want to replace their historic windows with modern substitutes in the name of energy efficiency. However, there are ways to improve energy efficiency without losing historic fabric and character. For example, low-profile storm windows are an appropriate and reversible treatment that increase efficiency and savings while preserving the historic windows. And of course, a rehabilitation must preserve, or replace in kind, important character-defining exterior features, including the historic roofing and siding material, exterior woodwork, and porch features. In a property's interior, we prioritize the treatment of primary spaces, such as front of house rooms, principal stairways, and corridors, as these were historically the most public areas of the structure. When floor plan changes are proposed, more flexibility is often available for secondary or back of house spaces, and these are often the areas where we can approve adding or removing walls. We are more likely to allow opening up a wall between a rear kitchen and a dining room, for example, than we are to open up a wall between the entry hall and front parlor. Important features and finishes should be maintained throughout to preserve the overall character and interior appearance of the structure. Historically painted woodworks should remain painted and historically stained woodwork stained. In historically finished structures, the original plaster should be retained wherever possible with the historic finish carefully trenched to accommodate new concealed systems. Where plaster is deteriorated beyond repair, it may be replaced in kind with smooth drywall. Although a popular modern trend, we would not approve removing historic plaster from walls to expose the underlying structural brick in a historic tax credit project as this would not have been the historic wall condition in a residential dwelling. As previously discussed, when new construction is proposed, it must meet the guidance of standards number nine and number 10, whether it is a new addition or a separate building, such as a garage. This means that the new construction must be appropriately located, generally on a secondary or elevation, subordinate in size to the historic structure, and have appropriate massing and materials. Here is an example of new construction that does not meet any of that guidance. And then here is an example of an appropriate porch enclosure. Glazing has been used to preserve the historically open appearance of the porches. All of these porches are located on rear elevations. The porch railings and columns have been preserved, meaning that the enclosures could be reversed without damage to historic fabric. And although they have become conditioned space, each porch still very much reads as a porch. We would like to devote some specific time to the issue of repointing because this is a common area of concern. In areas where historic mortar has worn away, it needs to be replaced with new mortar that matches the historic and strength, color, composition, and tooling pattern. This treatment is important not only for aesthetic reasons, but because historic bricks are physically softer than modern day bricks and mortar. If too hard a replacement mortar is used, then when moisture from the environment enters the bricks, it will travel to and settle in the weakest part of the exterior walls. Mortar is a sacrificial material that is meant to break down over time to protect the brick, and it can be easily replaced. But if new hard mortar is added to a structure and the historic bricks become the softest part of the building envelope, then water will settle in them, breaking down the brick units over time and leading to long-term structural issues. New systems incorporated into a historic building must be done in as sensitive a manner as possible. Special care should be taken to conceal new systems. Exterior HVAC condensers should be located on rear or secondary elevations and screened with plantings if necessary. Any rooftop mechanical unit should be appropriately sized for the structure and pushed back from the edges of the roof to eliminate visibility. 
Typically, it is possible to install rooftop mechanical units on flat roofs and less possible to sensitively install them on gabled or hipped roofs. In those cases, a ground mounted location would be preferable. In the building's interior, new systems should be concealed in existing and new walls and ceilings. Plaster should be carefully trenched and then patched to conceal new plumbing and upgraded electrical wires. Sensitively located soffits and chases are also acceptable. Again, these should be located so as to minimize their appearance. In the first photo, you can see that new air conditioning ducts have been left exposed or oversized and have been run in a significant primary space, a corridor. This work has a significant adverse impact on the historic character of the structure and would not be approved. In the second photo, you can see a new soffit that has been sensitively run and appropriately located. The historic corridors were left untouched. The new soffit has been held above the heads of the door trim. This work does not have a significant visual impact on the space. This concludes the Department of Historic Resources portion of today's session. On the screen, you will find the contact information for the staff members of the Virginia Historic Rehabilitation Tax Credit Program. On behalf of Chris, Summer, Carolyn, and myself, we thank you for your time and attention today, and we'll now pass you on to the rest of the excellent presenters. Okay, hey, Allison, um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen if you're ready. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Allison Blanton, an architectural historian with Hill Studio. And my presentation is really to follow up on the wonderful information DHR pr just presented and kind of help you understand your own house. And as they kept emphasizing, the ultimate goal is to retain and preserve the historic architectural character of the house. And so we're going to walk through ways to help you do that. Um, first and foremost is kind of understand the history of your house. When was the neighborhood developed? That has something to do with the overall character of it. Um, when was the house itself built? Who built it? And that could include the owner, the architect, as well as the builder. And then also who lived in it over the years? As they mentioned, period, the period of significance and the evolution of a building, this can come into play as different owners may have made changes over time. Right, so there's next slide. There are some excellent resources available to help you. And I kind of say this is like being a, a house detective. You um, dig into a lot of different resources trying to figure out the history of your specific house. But there's some great resources out there. Um, the Department of Historic Resources has a, a publication called How to Research Your Virginia Property, which has some wonderful in, information specific to Virginia records. They also have some great guidance on um, styles that you see specifically throughout Virginia. And then about a year ago, last year's um, Preservation Academy, there was a presentation which you can find in the archives of Preservation Virginia on how to research historic sites. So all of these are great resources and I encourage you to look into them. Um, next slide just shows you a variety of different types of resources out there that are available. These um, the applicability of each one of these to your specific property will depend on what kind of property you has, have. Is it rural, is it urban, the date of your property? You know, is it 18th century, mid 20th century? But here's just a, a range of um, information that's worth checking out and again, the resources that I mentioned before will lead you through each one of these and where to find them and how to apply them to your house and interpret them. Next slide. A few um, specific resources just to show you, it's like census records. These will show you the occupation of the person that lived in the house as well as how many people lived there. Were they all related? And if not, maybe it was um, you know, cut up into a boarding house at one time but that can be useful information. Also historic plats, which can often be found on GIS in your um, locality's engineering office. They might show you not only the overall development of the neighborhood when it was first platted, but also was your property subdivided at some point? Did it have other buildings on the property? So this is just another example of some information you can find. Next, the Sanborn fire insurance maps, which you see here on the left, are a wealth of information that we all use. Um, they include a lot of information that a fire insurance company was looking at to help determine the risk of fire for the property. But as you look at this one, you'll see that it has 
dash lines where porches are located and even has a number in there like a one or a two to let you know if it was a one or two story porch. They'll also show that number for stories inside the main outline of the house itself. There's little um, symbols in there that will tell you what kind of roofing material it originally had. And these maps, first of all, I'd say there is a legend at the beginning of these maps when you find them. Um, and they'll also, they're interspersed over different years. And so you can follow your own property over several different editions of these maps and find out if additions were made, if there used to be a garage um, or when a garage was introduced to the property, things like that. And then I'll also note um, there's sometimes the addresses change. And so it's always important to follow um, up and look at the local city directories. And you may not be aware, but the early city directories actually have a street index section in them where you can find your street, find your street number, I always recommend that you double check with the Sanborn map to make sure that you're still looking at the same house because um, a, a lot may have been subdivided over years or a vacant lot may have had a house built and the addresses might change. That's why on that Sanborn map, you see actually two addresses. So it's always important to kind of look at these two together. But once you've located who lived in your house um, at a certain year, you can also look back to the alphabetical part of the city directory and they'll give you the um, actual the occupation of that person so that's always fun to know and can again help you understand who lived there and what changes or when changes might have taken place and you can follow the city directories through the years to find out when different people um, moved in and out of the house okay next so <clears throat> the next thing besides learning about the history of your house is also combining it with an understanding of the architectural style. And of course, there are a wide range of um, residential architectural styles across Virginia, um, all of which kind of tie into different time periods, but not always specifically. You'll find these change or differ across the state. Um, some things may have been more popular in areas, some areas later than in other areas, but it just does have a very wide range. and. Next slide, some great resources for helping you figure out what kind of architectural style your house is, is both that DHR style manual that I mentioned earlier, and then also a book called The Field Guide to American Architecture, which um, by McAllister. And this has some wonderful um, illustrations in here, as I'm showing you here, that actually point out various details that you can look for in your house. And probably equally important as this is they have a lot of photographs of just what do these styles look like and real examples on the street, because we all know our houses don't always look like something straight out of the book. And so a number of these photographs will kind of help you look and see, oh, well, this is really what my house looks more like. And then these are also, I should mention, important features for you to recognize, identify in your own house as you're going back through the Secretary of the Interior standards, as DHR explained before, when you're doing a tax credit project, these are the things that you're going to want to retain and repair wherever you can. Okay, next slide. So now bringing both kind of the history together and the understanding of architectural styles into, again, being able to determine what's the architectural character of your house. Um, this three-step approach is presented by the National Park Service in Preservation Brief Number 17 on architectural character, and I had the link there, and I encourage you to check that out because they'll walk you through in more detail. But basically, you're looking at that um, kind of the neighborhood, the overall context, the block to understand the site, the setting, um, the form, the, the scale of your house, as well as the walls and, and openings. Second step is what I call kind of arm's length. It's really getting up a little bit closer to your, house, to your house and looking at the details, the materials, the craftsmanship that's used in them. And then finally, the third step is going inside and looking at how is the house arranged and so that it functioned the way that it was designed to function. Um, okay, next slide. To give you some kind of examples of looking at the overall character here again, we're looking at the context and the site and the setting looking at recognizing that different neighborhoods have developed at different times will um, look differently. You've got, you know, pre-automobile and pre-streetcar neighborhoods that are rather dense and don't have any driveways that might have more outbuildings associated with them. And then you get 
you know, early 20th century residential neighborhoods where streetcars existed as, and also you start seeing driveways and garages introduced. And then finally, um, you know, post-World War II, you're gonna see more suburban developments. You might not have a sidewalk. Garages may come up closer to the front or the side of the house rather than being at the rear. So this is just an important thing to understand kind of the, the overall context in which your house was built. Next slide. Just uh, the next thing is looking at the house itself um, and really getting your getting a handle on what is its its overall character. What is its form? Is it symmetrical, asymmetrical? Is it large? Is it one story and sprawling? Um, does it have a lot of features to it? Projections, whether it be dormers on the roof, turrets. Um, or whether it be porches on more than one side, or is it more simple and streamlined? Anyway, this is really where you're just looking at the overall um, form of your house and, and openings and rhythm of openings and symmetry of it to get an idea of what that character is. And then finally, on this first step, the next thing is to look more closely at some of the details that you see. Um, oh, I'm sorry, this is one where I'm also asking you to look all around the house. Um, this is an example of a house that has really four sides to it. It's, it's got features on every single side, a grand portico on the front, as well as a very elaborate port to share on the side. The rear elevation even has a little um, windowed breakfast room and hallway with a skylight over the breakfast room and a rear entrance. And then even the other side has a um, projecting conservatory. So this is a house that would be kind of hard to find a location to build an addition on without impacting all of these character defining features of this house. Okay, next slide, we're looking more closely. This is where we get more what I call arm's length. And you're looking at those details. Look at obviously porches um, are an area that have a lot of detail. And these details are things that help you tie back to that style book also, um, help you identify the style of your house. And again, identify the features that you're gonna need to retain under the tax credit program. But whether it's the type of windows that you have, the, the door, is it um, have a surround to it? Does it have glass in it? Um, roof, whether it's got a decorative cornice or, or dormers. Um, and again, the porches are very important. So these are all the details that you kind of want to look for in your house. And then the next slide is looking a little bit more closely again at the, at the materials and the craftsmanship. Um, is it handmade bricks from a mid 19th century building or is it wire cut bricks from something in the 20th century? Does it have um, you know, detailed stonework on it? Just looking more closely at the actual craftsmanship and the materials that are used. Okay, next slide. And the last step of looking at your house's character is really looking at the um, interior. And the plan is very important as um, Carolyn mentioned in the standards, looking at kind of a hierarchy of spaces. You'll see that in the plan on the right, you've got some large open rooms at the front with a grand central staircase. And then you can tell that as you get towards the top or the rear of the building, you're getting back into the more private areas or utilitarian areas where there might be more um, changes allowed, such as where the kitchen is. And then looking at the difference between your grand public staircase or central staircase, and then a rear staircase that might be found at the back. So just look at the plan, the circulation system, and kind of the spatial volumes of the different rooms and how they relate to each other will give you kind of an understanding of the hierarchy of the spaces and how the building was used. And then next, we look more closely at a lot of the features. And these are the things that you all are all very familiar with because you probably um, have certain ones in your own house that you love. But things like the staircases, the doors, um, the, the mantles, built-in cabinets, all of these are things that, again, relate to the time in which it was built, the way that um, people lived in the houses at that time, and just in the architectural style in which they were built. And they're all gonna be important to retain. And then the last level on the interior is just the finishes themselves. And again, as they mentioned in the standards, it's important if you have, um, stained woodwork that has not been previously painted, not to paint it. Um, however, if it has been painted, then, then that's okay. 
but you're looking at just finishes of how are the, the um, walls finished, you know, is it a flat plaster or is it a stippled or decorative plaster or the floors refinished or have they been painted, um, tiled floors, things like that. Just look and understand what level of finish they were done and know that that's part of that overall character. And then finally, looking at the evolution of your building, and this again is when you become a detective again because we are, want to understand how it evolved over time because depending on when that took place um, and how that relates to the period of significance, it may be considered historic rather, even though it may not be original in itself. But you may look for modifications such as cuts in the baseboard to know where a door might have been infilled. Um, you may look for you know, replaced or missing um, features or materials. Uh, flooring may have changed. And again, some of this, sometimes this may have happened during the period of significance. So you're looking back at when the owners, different owners live there, look at building permits, looking at um, the type of material that's being used, the treatment of it, of when that was common to help you understand when these changes took place. And then obviously additions. And again, an addition may be um, a historic addition or it may be a non-historic addition, but still eligible for the tax credits. And these are just things you want to look at to really understand the evolution of your building and how that relates to the period of significance and the overall historic character. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Allison. And now we will hear from Paige Pollard. Paige, and I will share my screen again. Super, thank you, Sonia. Um, and thanks for everyone for spending your afternoon with us. It looks like we may go over a little bit in terms of time, but I will uh, do my best to walk through my presentation quickly. Um, we thought that given the wonderful and uh, detailed information that you all uh, have just heard from all of the previous presenters, it might be helpful to just briefly walk you through um, uh, typical historic tax credit, residential historic tax credit application. And so I'm going to take a lot of the information that the other presenters um, share with you and just show you how that goes into an application that you might end up writing yourself. Um, so we're going to talk about a little bungalow. It's located in downtown Suffolk, Virginia uh, in a historic district. Next slide. Um, and so you know, just to reiterate the part one, the first step of the application is relatively simple and it's designed to confirm that the building is eligible for tax credits in the sense that it is a historic structure. And it's really a matter of pulling existing information together into an application form. Next slide. So the paperwork sometimes looks daunting when you first pull it down from the website or when you first open the email that Chris has sent you, but it's really not that complicated. The cover sheet of the part one really just asks for basic information like the property address and location, as well as your contact information. And um, if you're not the owner, then also separately the owner contact information. And really the only... Um, Thing on the first page that, that takes any level of effort is to decide what type of evaluation are you requesting. Most typically, if your property is located in an existing historic district, you're going to check the first box, which says that you're asking the, the state to verify that the building does contribute to the significance of the historic district it's located in. Next slide. The second page of the form um, is also relatively simple. It's kind of broken into two components. Um, at the top, you're asked to give the date and a very brief description of the building. And this is really so that the tax credit reviewer can ensure that the building that they're looking at in the National Register nomination is the same building as what they're looking at in your application and photographs. Um, and that it hasn't been substantially altered in a way that would change um, its designation from contributing, say, to non-contributing. So the top part of the, um, this page is just a brief description, two or three sentences. Um, and then the bottom part of the page is a place where you talk in, in a little bit of detail about how your property fits into the larger historic district where it's located. 
It may be that it's very similar and characteristic of all of the buildings in the district. It may be that it's very different and one of a kind or unique. But uh, the, sec the second box on the screen shows you just the level of detail. Uh, in this case, it's one of several bungalows in a, in a court of bungalows, which is a, a particular development style that adds to the character of the downtown Suffolk district. And that's really all you need to say. Um, you have several attachments, including photographs and mapping, and, and that together com comprises the part one application itself. Next slide. So these are a couple of examples of typical before photos. Um, I think for a house of this size, you know, I would typically recommend say 36 photos. You wanna make sure you get the general character of the exterior and interior. And you wanna make sure you get overall views of uh, primary spaces on the interior. But then also you want to uh, include eventually photographs that show details of areas where you're going to be undertaking substantial work. And as you can tell by these photographs, this house across the board required substantial work. Um, next slide. Um, so this is an example of the map that uh, just documents how the date was determined, um, the date of construction for this building. It's a Sanborn map like Allison talked about, and it just shows when the building appeared uh, in the Sanborn mapping um, documentation. So we know that the building was built by 1921. Next slide. So once you've submitted all of that material, uh, the staff at the Virginia Department of Historic Resources, most often Chris Novelli, review the application and they will respond with a letter. Uh, here's an example of the type of letter you can anticipate to receive. And it just simply says, we've reviewed your part one evaluation of significance and determined that the house and uh, associated outbuildings are contributing to the downtown Suffolk Historic District. So this tells you that your building is eligible for the tax credit. Next slide. The part two is where you talk about what you're proposing to do to the building in terms of renovation or rehabilitation. And so it, this is where you get into the highest level of detail um, and it's broken down typically by building component and it's also broken down by this condition and then proposed work. If you have a contractor, an architect or a builder involved in your project, a lot of this information will come from them and the development of the submission really needs to be um, done in partnership with those folks who are on your team. Next slide. The cover sheet of the part two application is the billing statement. And um, the Department of Historic Resources does charge a review fee to offset the costs of administering the program. The review fee is scaled to the size of the project. And that review fee is due based on the estimated project costs for the part two review. And then when you get to part three later on, um, it's uh, charged based on actual project costs. And this is again, just a form that captures basic information about the property, the property owner, and it, it ties the um, amount uh, of estimated costs to the review fee to the part two application. Next slide. So this is a glimpse of the part two application itself. The cover page collects a lot of the data we've talked about before in terms of the building address and location and the contact information and the property owner. It also asks you to give some information about the size of the property, the number of residential units or commercial units that might be in it currently and then after the project. And then also what you anticipate the total cost of the rehabilitation to be. Um, and this is truly an estimate, uh, but it's important to put in there so that DHR can uh, kind of understand the magnitude of the work and also to um, help document that you are going to meet the substantial rehabilitation test. Next slide. So the subsequent pages in the part two application break the are broken down by building component. And these are flexible. You can um, introduce the building components in the order that make most sense for your project. Um, 
And within each building component, you will talk about the date of kind of the original date, the date of any modifications, and then what the existing conditions are and the proposed work. So I've called out um, the plan section um, in this example. The, lar the original floor plan had not been altered except that the basement was finished after uh, the original house was built. So that's a very simple description, not requiring a lot of detail. And then the proposed work really involved a few key alterations in secondary spaces. But generally speaking, the majority of the original floor plan was gonna remain intact. And so that's how uh, this description was written. Um, next slide. So attached to that um, part two description will be supplementary information to help the reviewers understand the written narrative, which is binding, um, but to create some visual aids that help them really interpret what, you're, what you put in writing. And so, for example, in this case, um, hand-drawn floor plans, because an architect was not necessary for this project, and there were two key changes to the floor plan. Um, on the left side of the slide, you'll see that one of the bedrooms was uh, converted into a primary bathroom, and in doing so, one of the closet for that bedroom was actually reversed to create uh, two small closets for the primary bedroom. And then in the second, on the right side of the page, you'll see that there had been a door that allowed interior circulation between two bedrooms. And in order to achieve privacy, um, the applicant proposed to seal that door um, and so that each bedroom would be accessed separately and you couldn't go from one to the other. So those were really the two major floor plan changes for this project. Next slide. Um, the application went in and the response came back that the application was approved. Um, there was a condition in this project approval that um, there was a photograph, uh, that a, an additional photograph that the reviewer wanted to see. And that's because um, the applicant was proposing to make some alterations in that area and the reviewer felt that there wasn't sufficient documentation to make a decision. Um, also, the decisions about uh, heating and air conditioning systems hadn't been fully made. And so um, the reviewer indicated that if there are changes that are gonna be made from what's there now, they're gonna need some additional information. So um, the good news for this applicant was that they knew that the majority of their project was approved and they could proceed with that work, understanding that they had to sort out these last remaining details. Next slide. So the part three request for certification of completed work is really where you claim your credits. So at this point in the project, you have completed all the work and you've done it um, in accordance with the part two that was approved and any subsequent amendments. Um, and really, this is just an exercise in documenting how much money was spent and in demonstrating to the staff of the Department of Historic Resources that it was done in the way that they understood it to be in their part two review. Next slide. So again, the part three form, this should start to look pretty familiar. They're asking you for basic information about the property. And then there's a special box where you describe um, the start and completion date of the work. Um, and then this is where you use that uh, agreed upon procedures report or cost certification that your accountant prepared to populate boxes about what were the total eligible rehabilitation expenses incurred. And if there were any ineligible expenses, um, like Chris was discussing, might be site work, might be furnishings, might be um, window treatments, that kind of thing. Um, in the part three, you also include information about the assessed value of the building, excluding the land, as uh, the, determined by the local government the year before you start work. Um, this can be, uh, typically the tax assessor's office has this information, many times it's online, but sometimes for projects that uh, extend over a period, uh, you may have to call the tax assessor to get this information. 
And this information is really used to confirm that the project substantial rehabilitation test has been met. Next slide. So the second page of um, the part three application really is about uh, who the owner was that incurred the rehabilitation expenses. And um, this is about who the credits are issued to by way of the final approval letter. It also identifies the approved project contact so that the Department of Historic Resources knows who they can reach out to if they have any questions in the review of the part three. Uh, next slide. And then once a part three application is submitted um, and reviewed by the Department of Historic Resources, you will get a, a review response letter that documents uh, that the project is approved as consistent with the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation. Um, the letter will go on to say what the qualified costs were, and then it will provide you with the calculation of your credits earned, which would be 25% of those qualified costs. It also cites a completion date, and this letter is really utilized by your accountant as you file your tax returns in the coming years to um, utilize the credits against your income tax liability at the state level. Next slide. So that's the end of my presentation. I think I might've made up just a minute or two of time and then I'm gonna turn it over to morale to take it from here. Um, Sonia, remember, I think morale's um, slides are at the back end of my presentation. Thank you, Paige, um, and thanks for making up that time. Um, so we've heard from a group of great speakers uh, with lots of valuable information today. Thank you to all the presenters. I wanted to end with a bit of a summary um, before we open it up for questions. As a consultant, when I meet with a new client who's considering the rehabilitation tax credits for their home, I ask them several basic taken questions, if you will, that can help them decide whether or not the program is for them. I thought I'd share the top 10 questions that I ask um, with you today so you can see how they tie into what's already been presented. But I think really these are the sort of the first questions you should be asking yourself. And Sonia, I don't know if you're gonna put the slides back on. Well, I will just go not, ahead and- Can oh. you not see the slides? I can't, maybe everyone else can, but that's can fine. Everyone, oh. can everyone... The first slide, um, or the first- See the beginning of pages. So I think you need to scroll to the end because we're just seeing the main screen. Oh, there we go. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, first is, is your house um, either listed individually or is a contributing building in the Virginia Landmarks Register or the National Register of Historic Places? As we've heard that individual nominations and historic district nominations are easily found on DHR's website where they're posted, searchable by locality, and several other filters, and they're also downloadable. Also, if you are within a listed National Register Historic District, as opposed to being individually listed, you need to look at the inventory in the um, nomination form and see if you're listed as a contributing or a non-contributing resource. Second, if you're not listed, um, don't despair, because you can find out if your property is individually eligible for listing. Um, since the state, since this is for the state program, the property must either be determined individually eligible for listing, be listed individually, or be in a listed national register district prior to claiming the credits. But you could still get a determination of individual eligibility if you believe your house meets the criteria for individual listing. This is done through the evaluation team at DHR using a preliminary information form, which is also available on their website. Next. Once assuming, let's assume you're already listed. Um, 
you need to determine what the period of significance of my listing is. Um, and the importance of that, and I think several people have spoken about this, is um, you need to know that to understand what's going to be considered historic, because there's a difference between what is original to your house and historic. So to find out your period of significance, you check the National Register nomination for the property if it's individually listed, or for the historic district if it's in a district. In the case of the district, the period of significance will be determined by the history of the entire district rather than just your individual property. This can sometimes seem counterintuitive, but the period of significance is critical in relation to that standard number four that Carolyn talked about that states the changes to a building that have acquired historic significance in their own right shall be retained and preserved. So just because something isn't original doesn't mean it might not be historic. If that change was completed during the identified period of significance, it very well might be part of the historic character of the building that DHR takes into account when they review your proposed work. Similarly, work that's completed after the end of the period of significance then isn't usually considered a part of the historic character. Next. What's the assessed value of my house in the year before I start the work minus the value of the land? This establishes that amount you must spend to meet the threshold requirement for owner-occupied residential buildings. It needs to be at least 25% of that assessed value in the year before. Like Paige said, most of this information is available online through the Commissioner of the Revenue or even on GIS mapping that's tied into that. Or you can just give them a call and they'll be happy to help. Next. Always want to know what is the scope of your proposed work? This ties directly to the previous question because if your proposed eligible rehab expenses don't add up to at least 25% of the assessed value of your house, then you might want to consider including other things that are not you know, that are on your wish list but weren't necessarily part of the project. Um, and remember, but remember, additions don't count as eligible expenses. Next. What's my budget? Um, again, this ties into what you want to do and what's your budget, but it has to take into account that 25% of the assessed value, which applies to eligible expenses, such as heating, plumbing, electrical systems. And for state tax credits, unlike federal tax credits, you can also include geothermal systems and solar systems. Those are also eligible expenses. So again, I will ask people, okay, and this doesn't happen often because things are very expensive these days, but you might want to expand what you really uh, want to do. Maybe you were thinking of doing things over a long period of time, or you'd love to redo your kitchen in the future. Now may be the best time to do it and gang them all together so you can meet that threshold and get the tax credits. Next. How long do I anticipate the work will take? Uh, when we heard briefly about project phasing, that allows you to group tasks completed within a certain amount of time, and you can claim a credit for each tax year at the end of each phase. Otherwise, you have a two-year period to complete the work in one phase, and that is meeting that rehabilitation um, test, substantial rehabilitation test. Recently, I've been suggesting um, to people to go ahead and apply for a phase project, even though they may end up completing it in a shorter time frame. This allows you to hold open that 60 month period to meet the substantial rehab test. It doesn't require you to take that long nor require you to claim the credit in phases, but it just gives you an option and we all like options. Next. Uh, these last questions deal with uh, part three. Do I have an accounting firm and is this person familiar with rehabilitation tax credits? should ask them if they have a template or a guide about how they would like things reported to them from you so that they can then um, create the required materials as part of your part three application. Next. And does that firm have experience uh, with preparing agreed upon procedures 
um, which is what is required if you're spending less than uh, $500,000 or a full audit if it's above um, 500,000. And DHR has guides on their website under the Rehabilitation Tax Credit Program as to what's required to be reported. So I recommend you share that right away with your accounting firm. And lastly, if I've already started um, and I've just learned about these tax credit programs, and I, I get calls from people where, you know, they that is exactly what's happened. And um, it is still possible to apply, but you really must have good documentation of the property before the work began um, so that the reviewer at DHR can evaluate the proposed work. So if you have good photographs, that prove what the building looked like, um, it could work. I mean, there's also the risk that if you completed some of the work and it didn't meet the Secretary of Interior standards, that may have to be remediated for the overall project to be approved. That's just um, the warning and the caveat. Okay, I believe this ends our presentation to you all. I wanna thank again, all those on the panel and then we can open it up for questions. Or maybe we've answered all your questions. I don't. <laughs> well, we have. Uh, we have gone over, but um, we do have time, I guess, for a couple of questions. Um, and Morale, I'll go ahead and, and ask um, this one. Okay. Um, this is for everyone. Whoever wants to answer it, I'm hearing about using contractors. What if we are acting as our own contractor? We understand we would likely not be paid for our time but would materials be reimbursed, reimbursement qualified? What about getting bids for work we plan to do ourselves? Is that required? I can answer that perhaps. Um, so there is no bid requirement. So you don't have to you know, get three bids. Although we always recommend that if you're dealing with contractors, the more bids you get, kind of the more opportunity you have. Um, as far as, individuals doing your own work um, that can, the um, materials that you purchase um, for the rehabilitation work can be um, a part of those eligible rehabilitation expenses. You just can't, as you said, pay yourself for your own time and your own kind of sweat equity. Um, so that's kind of the only limiting factor. Okay, and another question, and then I think we'll probably end it here. Um, how are change orders handled when a planned restoration project runs into snags and the timeline materials or contractor changes? What are the homeowner obligations to keep a previously received approval intact? So that is the amendment process. Summer, do you want to talk about oh, that? Yes. Sorry, I was missing the button. Um, yeah, I think as I kind of discussed in the application or in our presentation, um, the first thing I would do is reach out to your reviewer when any, any change comes up and we can kind of give you guidance on whether or not it's something that requires an amendment um, or guidance on how to make sure whatever changes come up uh, might meet the standards. Um, but the first thing I would say is anything that kind of comes up or any snags, just reach out to us um, by either email or, or phone um, and we can guide you kind of through the next steps. Okay, great. Um, I know we've gone over, but Elizabeth, do you want to uh, say goodbye and end it? Just quickly, I want to thank everybody that participated in this this uh, webinar. I certainly learned a great deal of information. As a reminder to all the folks viewing, um, we will make this uh, a recording of this presentation available to you in the next few days. Um, and it'll also be posted on both DHR and Preservation Virginia's website. Um, I just can't emphasize how much important the Historic Tax Credit Program is to successful projects. And uh, with uh, DHR this year, Preservation Virginia and DHR will be evaluating the tax credit program, the economic benefits of it, and certainly be able to share with decision makers how essential this program is to historic places. So thank you for tuning in. Thank you for supporting both of our organizations. And we'll see you next season for the webinars. Thank you. Bye.